Hi, this is David with David's Tutorials, and this is probably the best recipe video I will have ever put out on YouTube. In spite of the fact that you will probably agree some of the recipes I have put out are outstanding, this one is going to be far and away on the top of that heap. This is my recipe for chocolate chip cookies. Now you might think chocolate chip cookies, well, everybody can make that. I'm going to tell you the story about how I developed this recipe and how it became a contest winner as I mix up these recipes. So stay tuned and I'm going to show you how to make these cookies. First, I wanted to show you this cookie book right here. This is a book that I bought in probably 1980. And in 1981 and 1982, I developed this recipe. And you can see now in this little bit of B-roll what I did in the upper right corner. I wrote the recipe for the best chocolate chip cookies ever. Now I had gone through probably 50 different iterations for this. Now I've got the recipe written down in a Word document and I can read that a lot better, especially since my eyes are kind of going out of focus here. But what you need for this recipe is the following. You need two sticks of butter. You need one cup of butter flavored Crisco. Now butter flavored Crisco is made of regular Crisco with butter flavoring in it. And if you didn't know this, Crisco is made out of cottonseed oil. There's a whole story behind that, but it's not a time to go into it right now. In addition to the butter and the butter flavored Crisco, we're going to need one and one third cups of sugar. Now I've already measured all these things out, so I'm not going to have to measure them while you wait. Two cups of brown sugar. You need two eggs. You need three tablespoons of vanilla. You need three and one half cups of flour. You need, I think it's two teaspoons of salt and one and one half teaspoons of baking soda. And then there's going to be some extras that we add at the end. The key to this, this is what I have found that works for me. First thing I'm going to do is take a glass bowl and I'm going to put the butter in it. Now the reason I have a glass bowl is just in case the butter is still refrigerated, I can put the glass bowl in the microwave for about 15 seconds and soften up the butter. I don't want to melt the butter, but definitely I can put a glass bowl in the microwave, whereas if it were a metal bowl, I could not do that. Now this has been sitting out on the counter for probably an hour. So it's reasonably soft. I'm probably not going to have to stick it in the microwave. The drawback to that, of course, is that some of the butter sticks to the wrapper. Now, generally, the proportions of butter to butter flavored Crisco are about one to one. And here's the butter flavored Crisco. Once I have the butter and the butter flavored Crisco in the bowl, I am just going to kind of mash them together first to mix them and second to get them just a little bit softer. You can see I am doing this with a fork, and that lets some of the nice butter and mar uh, margarine shortening squeeze through the tines of the fork and helps it mix better. And that looks pretty good. That's all I'm going to do to start. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add the sugar. There's that sugar. And I'm going to add the brown sugar. And there's the brown sugar. The goal in this first mixing stage is to get the shortenings and the sugars nicely blended. Now, if you haven't done this much in you blending it by hand, 
you will probably start getting a little bit of cramp in your hand, and that's to be expected. But tough it out, and you will be well rewarded. Now, as you can see, I'm going through the entire mixture of sugars and shortenings here, and it looks to me like it's pretty well blended. Now, a lot of people would be tempted at this point to take a little snitch, and you know, quite honestly, there's nothing wrong with that. All right, now we're going to put in some of the liquids. Yes, eggs are a liquid. We're going to put in two eggs. Now I'm going to break the eggs into the bowl first, and the reason for that is just in case there's a little piece of shell in there, it's going to be easier to dig that shell out of the bowl than it would be to dig it out of the cookie batter. So here we go. That one looks pretty good. I'll go ahead and dump that in. Let's get this one. And that one looks good too. So we'll dump that one in. Notice how bright orange that particular yolk is. The reason is we get our eggs from pasture-raised chickens. And pasture-raised chickens have no hormones, no vitamins. They eat things that chickens are supposed to eat, which is bugs and seeds and all of the things. They're not just fed on corn. And if you look it up, you'll probably find many reasons why pasture-raised chickens produce eggs that are much healthier than eggs from those chickens that are not pasture-raised. Okay, that started to mix in. The next thing is three teaspoons of vanilla. Double checking, yes, that is a teaspoon. Let me make a little pocket here in the dough so it doesn't run down the side. There we go. And I'm going to one. As I've said in my recipes before, in most recipes, as long as you get close to the quantity asked for in the recipe, you're probably going to be okay. So now we have the liquids in there, the eggs and the vanilla. I'm going to mix that up, make sure it's nice and mixed in. That looks very good. Now at this point, by the texture of the dough, which you can see is kind of loose, but it also holds together, I can tell this is going to be a marvelous batch of cookies. I have made dozens of batches of these particular cookies, not just during development when I'm sure I made more than 50 different batches. And of course, all the batches that weren't quite good enough, we had to take care of them somehow. So, oh well, just tough it out, I guess. But at this point, I can tell that this is going to be a very good batch of cookies, or if it's a little bit too viscous, then I might need to put in a little bit more liquid of some type, some vanilla or what have you. Now it's time to add the flour. I have here three and a half cups of flour, pre-measured, 1,322 grams if you want metric or weight. You know, I've always thought it's much more accurate to weigh your dry ingredients, and yes, even your wet ingredients, than it is to try to measure them and then just estimate. But as I said, accuracy is not that essential. If you get close to it, it's good enough. Try it yourself, you'll find out. We also need to add some salt. Let me check how much. Two teaspoons of salt and one and one half teaspoons of baking soda. And open up the salt dispenser so that we have pour. There's one teaspoon. That was kind of a generous teaspoon, so I'm going to make this one not quite so generous. Teaspoon. And one and one half teaspoons of baking powder. Take me, take it back. It's not baking powder, it's baking soda. You should always try to make sure 
which you're getting, baking soda or baking powder, and this recipe calls for baking soda. Some fell out of there, and I think that's going to be good enough, and that's now empty. Okay, while I'm mixing this, let me tell you this story about how I developed the recipe. My wife and I were living in Maine, and I decided one Christmas I wanted to make some chocolate chip cookies, and I got out the Nestle Cool House bag, and of course, on the back of every bag, you've got Nestle Toll House Cookies recipe. I don't know if it's on the back of every bag now, but it was back then. And so I started with that, and I said, hmm, I wonder if this would be better if I, and then I thought about what I could do to make it better. And I tried, as I said here a few minutes ago, probably 50 different batches of these cookies before I finally settled on the recipe that I'm showing you right now. And this recipe turned out to be contest winning cookies. Now in 1991, those of you who were around then may remember, and those of you who weren't around then but have studied history may know, that that was when Iraq invaded Kuwait. And the United States finally stepped in and says, we're not going to stand by and let you just go in and take over another country because you are big enough to bully them into doing what you want to do and steal all their stuff. And of course, I'm sure there was some sort of oil interest involved in there as well. But the U.S. response to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait was called Desert Storm. Well, at that time, I was in the Air Force in Montgomery, Alabama, and I was the chief of the computer department for the Community College of the Air Force. I'll tell you about the Community College of the Air Force later on if anybody says they're interested in it. But we decided we wanted to have a unit-wide party just to kind of bring everybody together and have some fun. You know, everybody's working really hard, and so you want to give everybody fun. And so we thought we'd have a potluck, and we talked about it, and we said, you know, when you get potluck, people bring stuff that's meats, and they bring vegetables, and they bring side dishes. But the thing that everybody really goes for is dessert. So why don't we just forget the things that people are not sure they want and go for what they do want. Let's just make this a dessert tasting and contest. So we did. We had the first annual, and it probably, as far as I know, was the last annual Community College of the Air Force Dessert Tasting and Contest. And you know what we called it? Dessert Storm. I thought that was clever. I don't think I thought about it. Somebody in my unit thought of that, but whatever it was, it just felt right because we had Desert Storm going on, so we had Dessert Storm. And the way it worked was that everybody would bring in a dessert that they could serve in bite-sized portions, and then people who attended the fun people who attended the function would then buy tickets at a quarter apiece or seven for a dollar. And for every ticket, you could get a bite of one of the desserts. So there was probably, oh, 30 or 40 different desserts entered in this thing, maybe 50 of them as far as I know. But there were a lot of desserts entered. And we had categories, we had pies, we had cakes, we had cookies, um, and miscellaneous, I think. And when people got a bite of their dessert, they were able to vote for it on a one to seven level. And the one to seven, the, the number one was uh, a smiley face with great big eyes and the tongue hanging out and drool coming out all over. And number seven was a yuck face. And there were all the ones in between. And they were able to mark that dessert from one to seven and put it in that particular entries contest box. And we had, I think, 125 people attend the dessert tasting and contest, and most of them bought at least a dollar's worth of tickets. Seven dessert samples for a dollar, you can't beat that. And I did not win the overall prize for these cookies. 
I was sad, but hey, I was one of the people organizing a contest, so I was kind of glad that somebody who wasn't an organizer won the overall. But I did, with these cookies, win the cookie category. Now, the prizes for this contest, some of the people at the community college on staff there, they found some desert camouflage fabric down at the local fabric store, and they made an apron for each one of the categories. And the person who won the grand prize, they also got a chef's hat made out of the same material. So I thought that was a really fun kind of contest to take part in. And now you know the story behind how I got the recipe and how this recipe became a contest winner. I know it was just a small contest, but hey, I can still say they were a contest winner. What we have here is the basic cookie dough. You could cook it like this and it would make pretty good cookies. What we're going to do now is going to make all the difference in the world. We're going to add Baker's Sweet chocolate, German's sweet chocolate from the Baker's Company. We're going to add some chocolate chips and we're going to add some chopped pecans. And that makes all the difference. Now before I get into that and show you how I do that, uh, I will tell you a Christmas variation on this. And I was going to make half of this dough into a Christmas variation. Means you leave out the Toll House morsels and instead, you add an equivalent amount of red and green M&Ms. That gives you the Christmas color. And then you add a bag, and I couldn't find this in the store here recently when I looked. It's Andy's Peppermint Chips. You add, I think, half a bag, which would be about three ounces. And that gives it this beautiful peppermint flavor, which is very evocative of Christmas. And, of course, the red and green M&Ms also are very Christmassy. But without that, we're going to have to add just the Toll House morsels, the German sweet chocolate, and the pecans. And they're going to be normal cookies. And that's what we'll just have to put up with for this particular recipe. Right now, I'm going to go turn on my oven to 375 degrees and let it preheat. 375 degrees, of course, that's Fahrenheit. It would be 190 degrees centigrade. First thing we need to do is chop the chocolate. And this is a double recipe. And for a double recipe, I need four ounces. And wouldn't you know it, this box is exactly four ounces. One of the most important things to keep in mind as you're making any recipe is that the fresher your ingredients, the better the recipe is going to be. Now, I can see the chocolate has got these squares marked off on it. And I'm going to go ahead and cut it along that. And you can see that it broke. And you know what? That doesn't matter. Because it's going to be broken apart anyway. Now, you've heard me say, if you've watched some of my videos, you've probably heard me say, that one of the more important aspects of any recipe is chalk size. And that's very important with this Baker's German Sweet Chocolate. We want chunks that are big enough that you can actually tell they are chunks. And this is about the size I like. And I want them not so big that they get in the way when you try to take a bite of cookie such that all you get is a bite of that particular kind of chocolate. You want to leave room in the bite for the other stuff, like the chocolate chips and the pecans. There we go. All right, there's the top, there's the bottom, there's halfway. I'm going to pinch it, and don't go in. A couple more, there we go. And the only other thing to add going to be the pecans. And it's between one and two cups, and I generally like to go on the high side. <laughs> now we're back to mixing. You can see this large bowl is kind of full. So I'm having to be very careful as I <clears throat> stir up these pecans and chocolate and chocolate chips and dough that I don't nudge some of it out of the bowl. Now, these cookies, whenever I made them, were such a hit 
with people, I would make batches of these and give them away as Christmas presents. And of course, whenever I did that, people would ask me, can I get a copy of the recipe? And so my policy was for a number of years, I'll say, well, I'll be happy to give you a copy of the recipe. My fee is that whenever you make a batch of these cookies, you bring me about a half a dozen of them. And they would all agree to that. Oh, yeah, well, sure, I'll be happy to do that. And you want to know something? Of all the people I gave this recipe to, probably not more than about 15, only one actually ever brought me cookies. And he did it, oh, the whole time that he and I were stationed together. And I appreciated that, and that was very nice and responsible of him. And for the people out there who I gave this recipe to that did not bring me their fee for the cookies, well, they just showed me what kind of person they are. And they get to choose that, just like you get to choose what kind of person you want to be. Now, you notice in this cookie dough, it looks like it is really larded with chunks. And yes, that's true. It is, and it should be. But it is also set to the point that these cookies will be able to have a chunk of all the different things in it. You're going to get, of course, the cookie itself. You're going to be able to get a piece of pecan, and you're going to be able to get a chocolate chip, and you're going to be able to get a piece of the baker's chocolate. And all three of them together really make the difference in this cookie. So, this looks like just the right consistency based on all my years of making batches of these cookies. Now I'm going to be digging down because I want to make sure there's no patches where there's nothing but chunks or nothing but dough. I'm going to make sure it's all mixed together. The next thing we need to do is put the dough onto the cookie sheet. Now, because these cookies are so chunky, I'm going to use a cookie scoop, but I'm going to use a pretty big one because I want to get a bunch of chunks in there. <clears throat> Let's see just how big this one is. It looks like it's a two inch cookie scoop. So let's get started. Now as I remember it, I don't know if this is the right one or not. Well, we're going to find out, aren't we? We could get three, three by four. That's a dozen cookies per sheet. going to go put these into the oven and I'm going to cook them for about nine minutes. What's going to happen is they're going to spread out, they're going to puff up, and then they're going to go down flat again and that's what you're looking for when they go down flat again. Give them oh another 30-45 seconds and they're going to be ready. Let's go put them in the oven right now. Timer. Nine zero zero start. We're just going to see how well that works. Now I had thought that that two inch scoop was a little bit too big, and I dug and I found this one and a half inch scoop. Yeah, there's a one and a half inch scoop. I'm going to make this next batch one and one half inch scoop cookies. As I had thought before, we didn't just get a three by four cookie layout on the cookie sheet, we got a 4x4, four four, and that worked okay. And this definitely looks a lot more like what I remember it used to be. Now, I've been on a ketogenic diet for coming up on five years now, and I haven't eaten or made any of these cookies in all that time. So I am out of practice. But being able to put 16 cookies on a tray instead of just 12 gets you through a lot more cookies when you're done. I'm going to finish baking that first batch of cookies and we'll see how that turns out 
and then we will cook the second batch. Then I'll cease making the video for a little bit until it is time to show you the finished results. But 4 by 4 on this fairly large cookie sheet is a very good distribution of cookies. You're probably going to have to adjust your layout on your cookie sheet based on the size of a cookie sheet you have and the size of a scoop you've got. And just make your own adjustments and I think you'll be happy with whatever it is you come out with at the end. Okay, it turns out that two inch scoop I used for the first batch was too big. The cookies are spread out, they're puffed up, they've gone down a little bit and they're starting to get brown. I'm thinking I'm going to have to take them out before they go all the way flat like I'd like them to get. And that's okay, they're going to come out good anyway, but uh, I may have to take that first batch out before they get to the point I would really like them to get. I'm going to take another look at it right now and we'll see what we do. I need to let them sit for just a couple of minutes to let them firm up. Meanwhile I'm going to go swap trays in the oven. this tray on top. Ooh, they're just about done. And this tray on the bottom. I need to get these off of this tray quick because the next batch is just about done. Notice the color. Very nicely toasty brown. Now before I got a cookie scoop, for many years I would just dig out the amount that seemed right by hand and I would just roll it into a ball like that and put it on the cookie sheet. So if you don't have a cookie scoop, then you're welcome to roll your dough by hand. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to try one of these things, but these, if they're not the best chocolate chip cookies you have ever had in your life, tell me about it. Tell me where you've had better. I bet you haven't. <laughs> oh my. As you can hear, these are very crunchy. And that's what they should be. If you don't like crunchy cookies, then you can go find another recipe, but I think you'll like these. If you're not already a subscriber to David's Tutorials, go ahead right now and click that subscribe button and then the bell icon so that YouTube will notify you whenever we post another great tutorial right here on David's Tutorials. Give us that thumbs up so that I and the YouTube robots will know that you thought this was a good video. Share the video. This is prize winning, award winning, contest winning cookies that you need to share with anybody you know that likes cookies. And finally, leave us a comment in the comment section down below and let us know after you make the cookies how well you like them. So take care everybody, have a wonderful day, and enjoy these cookies.